May I draw your attention to an excellent session that took place in the Charing Cross Symposium in 2018 and was repeated in Aortic Live in Hamburg. It now takes on an additional interest and importance. This is the question of type 2 endoleak with sac expansion. This was part way through the EVAR trials in 2010 at about 10 years of follow-up, certainly patients more than eight years. And this is when some of the trouble started to occur. An analysis of the patients so far showed that was sac expansion in association with secondary sac rupture was quite common. It occurred in these various categories. Type 1 endoleak, either type 1A or type B. Type 3 endoleak, migration, which implies a type 1A endoleak. Kinking, which implies a type 1A endoleak. Or a type 2 endoleak, but type 2 endoleak only seemed to be important by way of causing secondary rupture only when there was sac expansion. And so this alerted us for the first time to the importance of sac expansion. I want to draw your attention to these excellent presentations of ways in which these experts, some radiologists and some leading endovascular surgeons, how these experts manage to correct type 2 endoleak. There are various approaches and they require supreme skill. This is the start of a, quite an interesting symposium on alternative access for uh, type 2 endoleaks. And my this is my title. Are any of the embolization methods any good? Well, this is really very important. And then which method should be used to treat type 2 endoleaks? We don't know yet. And which are the embolic agents of choice for each method? So we'll just deal with the embolic agents. The, you'll know that these are the main embolic agents for endoleak embolization. They're the liquid embolics, of which Onyx is the most well known, but there are some new kids on the block. Uh, some people use glue, I don't, and then other people um, use either pushable or detachable coils. I think the detachable coils are quite good for some endoleaks. This is my technique, my approach. For IMA, I work out whether the IMA is a supply or an exit in vessel. I go for the trans arterial route first, try and embolize the nidus if I can. I usually use a liquid embolic agent. If I can't access the IMA nidus, so I consider one of the other options. And for the lumbar, um, I try the trans iliac parandograph route first and I try the trans arterial route, but to see if it's actually worthwhile trying. And uh, use a combination of uh, liquid embolic and coils. And um, again, use the trans cable access or remote embolization if there's no other, other, other option. Thank you very much for your attention. The transarterial uh, pathways to endoleaks are, there are several of them, the two most common are the SMA through the arc of Riala to IMA endoleaks. The combination of deep circumflex iliac artery, iliolumbar artery and fourth lumbar artery that gives us an avenue from the groin to get to the internal or to the aorta for lumbar endoleaks. Two less common ones are the internal approach from the lateral to the median sacral to get to aortic endoleaks, and then the common femoral obturator to internal iliacs, and then finally the superior gluteal. Um, one of the key aspects of uh, the transarterial approach is to think your way in from the CT scan. You should know where the branch is and what projection will show it before you start the case. The SMA has too many branches to be making it up as you go along. In answer to one of Rod's questions, whether uh, I embolize the nidus or the stem of the IMA. It depends on the ultrasound whether it tells me it's a type 2A or a type 2B endoleak. If it really looks an ultrasound classically like a pseudoaneurysm with the flow in and out and no other flow, then I'll just embolize the stem. Otherwise, I'll embolize the nidus also. So at the end, I mean, we managed to do uh, uh, what we wanted to do, but it was, at least in my hands, uh, quite difficult. It was uh, complex, it was time and dose consuming. And I don't want to be exposed to a high level of radiation uh, during uh, those cases. So although I think the transarterial route is the perfect route for uh, IMA and the leaks, I think that uh, for those ileolumbar and the leaks, we need to find alternatives. 
And so we'll soon see uh, images of transcurval embolization, which is actually not that difficult to perform if you routinely uh, use fusion, uh, but it only works if the endolic is not uh, too low in the aneurysm sac, because if you're too near the, um, the bifurcation of uh, the IVC, then your uh, trans um, uh, septal needle will have issues to, to get into the, the nidus. The transcending embolization works well, but mm, probably not all the time. And since we've switched five years ago to doing all our cases in a hybrid room, uh, we routinely uh, use cone beam CT, and uh, it's part of our um, routine workflow, so uh, the translumber uh, approach seems to be the uh, right approach uh, uh, for our patient. So it's safe and efficient. It's actually faster in my hands than the transarterial uh, routes, uh, easy with the new generation uh, hybrid rooms uh, with the cone beam CT. So again, rule out type one and type three, use transarterial for IMA, and use uh, trans lumber uh, for uh, the lumber ambulance. Thank you for your attention. The puncture technique in a trans cable approach is very convenient for, uh, uh, for an endovascular operator because you can keep standing on the right patient groin side and the needle that you use usually is a so-called broken bone needle which is for transeptal uh, puncturing but tips needle probably uh, work in the same uh, way. Advantage is that you can do this under local anesthesia, supine so position, and what's an advantage compared to lumbar is that you get a very stable position of the sheath. You get just the right distance from the groin to your target to allow you to, to use a standard uh, catheter length and uh, also have a good um, angle towards the lumbar arteries, which are the most frequent uh, uh, selective arteries that you want to uh, that we, you want to selectively embolize. Um, but having said that, I need to agree with my, the the previous speakers that uh, the techniques are rather complementary than competitional, and we use at least three or four of the named techniques uh, depending on anatomy and and endoleak type and what uh, whatever. But to be honest, transcable has become our favorite because of uh, numerous advantages. So what do, you, what, do you see, what do you see here is a typical situation. You have a, a dorsal uh, type 2 endoleak, you have the aneurysm that has grown half a centimeter, and you have the cable that at a length of at least two centimeters usually has a very close contact to the, um, to the aorta, which is not pressurized. This short movie shows you we have this broken bone needle that has this uh, curve, it has, a, um, it has an indicator, and as Stefan showed, we use fusion technology. The puncture under fusion and also different projections is usually a relatively quick thing, and you see the movement here. If you don't, if you miss it, it's not a disaster, and you're in the retroperitoneal space and you do it again. The first angio, as you've shown, usually shows you the contributors, and you can selectively go into those vessels and embolize them either with microcatheters or as in this case also with, the, with, with macro coils. And if the coils, that, as this Nestor coil is too long, it's not a disaster. If you miss the selective arteries, what we do is coil embolization and also glue, as you, uh, as you see here, which is our preferred liquid embolic uh, agent. So to conclude, transcable embolization is a safe and feasible technique in most patients. It's our preferred uh, first option if the patient has suitable anatomy. Um, and especially after selective embolization, we see a, a high degree of suck uh, uh, regression and have not seen suck enlargement. We all agree that you don't treat type 2s very often, but there is a category of malignant type 2 that is almost like a congenital AVM, that you treat it one way, it pops up another way, you treat it again. These patients require hyper-monitoring. Sometimes you never do really solve the problem for the long run. And I think one of the things highlighted in this session is that there are a lot of different ways to get into the sac and a lot of different ways to treat it. And I'll bet in our discussion we'll decide that we all use a lot of these methods. I know I do. Um, I don't think anyone is particularly perfect or the best, but there are some that are better in certain clinical situations. So we do typically two or three cases a year of a transfemoral approach. It's in just another way to get into the sac. There are some advantages to it. Uh, you don't poke a hole in the aorta. Uh, Translumbar approach it seems to be extraordinarily safe, but just sort of empirically, the idea of poking a hole in the aorta if you don't have to. 
Um, I, I kind of like that idea. This idea of potentially using the around the graft approach to treat a type 2 endo leak that's proven that it needs treatment while the patient's been under surveillance. And so our, our strategy is to treat the IMA and lumbars using a transarterial approach, but then if the sac still needs obliteration, then go ahead with a trans uh, graft or paragraft approach. In conclusion, it's another way to get into the sac. It's another way to address chronic type 2 endo leaks that should be in our bag of tricks. An advantage, you can put in a larger bore uh, sheath than typically you would necessarily for maybe a trans lumbar approach. You can reach areas that are low, quite distal and posterior. Uh, in my experience, it works best if you've already addressed the IMA and lumbars, if possible, using transarterial. And you can combine it with, uh, with thrombotic agents, glue, etc. Now that you've seen uh, these ways of correcting type 2 endoleak, I want to remind you that the key and important ones that are very dangerous and deadly even are the ones type 1 endoleak, type 3, migration kinking, which every practicing endovascular surgeon is capable of correcting and it is urgent. So it tells us that when sac expansion is occurring, we need to move quickly. Fortunately, type 2 endoleak with, with, with um, sac expansion is not as common and frequently type 2 endoleak doesn't have sac expansion. Perhaps those are less serious. But those that do have sac expansion, you will now see from this video all of the various techniques that are required in your armamentarium to be able to correct those type 2 endoleaks. It may be that in the future we look for sac expansion to tell us if there's a functional endoleak. But what is the point of finding a functional endoleak if you cannot perform a rupture preventing reintervention? So therefore, as well as putting in EVAR, we've learned from the EVAR trials and the long follow-up that we have to know how to correct the endoleaks and we have to know which of our patients are likely to have serious endoleaks. Thank you.